Hello, my name is Jeff Mims, and I am a Doctor of Psychology candidate with the Creativity Studies Specialization at Saybrook University. Um, today's presentation, I'm going to talk about music meaning and the return, which is rooted in an autoethnography that was done on my family's history um, with music. Um, this study was, was basically conducted to better understand the ways that my family has used music as a way to heal, as a way of being, and to foster relationships. Um, furthermore, I wanted to explore my personal, personal connection with music, me being a professional musician and a musician researcher and a lifelong learner. So this is the foundation and basis for my study. I hope that it will give you some sort of encouragement or inspiration into maybe doing an autoethnography on your family's history or the things that you feel connected to, to seek out the larger meanings. Thanks. Music, Meaning, and the Return, an autoethnography by Jeff Mims. So this is essentially um, my journey with music, right? So I'm gonna talk about um, music, um, how it's been for me, how it's shown up for me, myself being a musician, the meaning, what meanings emerge out of that experience or, or, along that journey, and then also the return. The return um, also got points back to Joseph Campbell, the heroic journey where he talks about the hero returning, uh, you know, after his life journey, after he's experienced some hardships and some trials, returning um, to his people with the boom, with the with a deeper understanding and connection of, of, of that journey and the meaning. And so for me, my musical, my journey is a musical journey. And so seeking out larger meaning and then also returning with the boom. So the description for this presentation is, uh, this presentation, I'm just gonna read it. This presentation highlights the creative practices of a family's cultural tradition of using music as a way of being through connecting with people, responding to trauma, fostering relationships, and connecting with the higher being. This presentation encourages participants to explore the deeper meanings of their own creative inspiration. Okay, and so I'm going to begin this presentation with, uh, I'm going to talk about music meaning. So here's our agenda. This is what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about music and meaning or music and what that you know, has meant to me or the different meanings that emerge. And they're not just meanings that are subjective. Some of these meanings are psychological. And so I'm going to first point out the auto ethnographic research that was done. There was an auto ethnographic inquiry that really was the foundation for this whole presentation. And the reason that I got involved um, with this project and really just wanting to explore my own, you know, own personal connection with music, my own family's history um, with music. And, and to really seek out those larger meanings. And so in doing that, there were a ton of psychological themes that are really meaningful that um, became made available to me, you know, just throughout this process. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about, or the first theme really that emerged out of this study was um, musical creativity. And so there are some examples of really uh, a real organic way of using music, creating music, writing music, sharing music with an audience, recording music, um, that creative product. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, um, music as a way of being. Um, you know, I consider myself to be a musician. That is a, a part of who I am. That is a part of how I identify myself. Um, and then expression, a musical expression, that creativity, um, shared experience. So here we're talking more about a phenomenological shared experience when, you know, the connected uh, nature of music or the things that happen around music experience. And then we point to the return, which again, with the return, we're pointing back to Joseph Campbell's um, heroic journey. Okay. And then for the, you know, for the course, for the sake of this uh, presentation, the journey in, in this regard, we're, we're talking more specifically about the, the musical journey, my musical journey. All right. And then, you know, I'm going to I'm going to prompt a dialogue basically on some, you know, there are some frequently asked questions or some questions that, you know, may come up some other information that I can share that we could kind of, uh, you know, basically would be room for fur further discussion or further research that could be made available. All right. So before we get started, our, actually, we, the first thing that I want to do is. I would like to begin this part of the presentation with the story. 
So um, just just um, listen, if you will. All right. So it was December the 9th, 1984. And the band was in a heightened state of performance. They were really, really jamming out. They were like, it was the height of the, the climax of the concert, right? So you've got the band is just, you know, going at it. The, the audience is really into it, really feeling, feeling the, the performance. Again, this is the height of the performance. Now, the guitar player, he's really feeling it. He's just jamming away and, you know, he's, he's really just doing his thing. Mind you, his wife is on the front row, um, about nine months pregnant, going into labor, right? And so the guitar player's playing and, and wife is going into labor on the front row and she's trying to get trying to get the guitar player's attention and he's jamming and she finally gets his attention and basically says, you know, the baby is coming, the baby is coming and he's still jamming, he's still jamming. And it just seemed the harder that he played, the harder the baby would kick, right? And so... The the so you know the baby's coming. He's like, okay, are you sure the baby's coming? She's like, yes, the baby's coming. The baby's coming. So the song stops. The song ends, and the the pregnant wife on the front row signals to the guitar player and says, "It's time to go. We got we gotta go. The baby's coming." And the guitar player looks at her and replies, "Well, can do we have? Can we do one more song? Can we play one more song?" And she's like, "No." So obviously they stopped. They went to the hospital and that was the night that I was born. And so that is a story that has been told to me over and over time again over the years. And it's something that, you know, I've always wanted to understand, always wanted to explore further. Right. Um, you know, my connection with music, th even this presentation is something that is deeply personal to me. Right. Because, again, this autoethnography, I'm looking into my family's history. I want to know the source of my inspiration. I want to know where this comes from, right? I want to know how my um, ancestors have used music, you know, as a way to, in, in similar ways that I've used music as well, okay? And so that is really the foundation for this. And again, this is deeply personal. I'm going to share some more personal stories um, as we go through this autoethnographic uh, auto journey um, of music meaning in the return. And so it takes me to Two questions, two um, basically topics of inquiry, you know, two areas that could be really um, unpacked further. And really, these are really probably psychological questions that you could ask, right? So the first question is, what was so special about the performance, right? The, I'm talking about the musical performance with the guitar player. This, this performance, this guitar player wanted to delay or was willing to delay the birth of his child you know, just for, a, you know, a few more moments within this experience, within this lived experience. So this is really a phenomenological question. As a lived experience, what is happening in that moment of music that, you know, people seem to not want to let go? Or in this case, my dad. Why did my dad want to let go of that moment? Okay. And so another question, psychological question we could ask is, what can be said about the conversation between the baby in the womb? and the musical environment, right? Um, again, because the, the conversation was every time the, you know, the music would, the harder they would play, the harder the baby would kick. And so you have this almost call and response, if you will. It, you know, it, we may not label it that, but we could definitely explore that um, much further, right? To, to see, you know, what's happening in the wood. One of the things that come up or emerge out of that is, I thought about Carl Jung's collective unconscious, right? The unconscious mind, is genetically inherited. Carl Jung basically believed that we inherit the psyche through our DNA as well, and, and we carry that DNA um, of, our, of our ancestors. And so through that, we're connected to those traumas, we're connected to those experiences, um, you know, and then maybe even our interests, right? Our My connection with music, maybe that conversation that was being had in the womb is a part of that, you know, maybe there is really something happening with that. Maybe that is, you know, the conscious mind or unconscious mind, you know, on display in, in real time. Who knows, right? But it's definitely something that we could, we could, you know, it's definitely grounds for further exploration. All right. So one of the things that I also want to talk about um, 
that really kind of jumped out at me throughout this research was this idea of legacy, right? Um, you know, again, the inheritance that the, the carrying on the tradition or the interests, you know, or even really being connected to similar things to that of those who've come before. All right. And so, um, we're, so we're looking at um, a group called the Pilgrim Wonders. Um, if you look to the left, so the guy third from the left is John H. Mims. That is my granddad. And this was their group. This was back in 1961. And I'm just going to read some of this. So creating and performing music is a family tradition dating back to at least the 1940s in America's Deep South. So this is a tradition within our family um, that goes back at least to the 1940s. And the reason I say 1940s instead of much, we know that it goes much further, but we can actually, we have some pretty good archival data and can document really well back to the 1940s. Um, and so the Pilgrim Wonders, throughout this experience, throughout their journey um, of using music as a, a musical ensemble or a quartet gospel singing group, they encountered a lot, right? So the first thing that comes up is they had to travel at night, right? And so just to give some context, America's Deep South was, this is a time of racial segregation. This was a time of racial violence, you know, um, you know, and so it was understood that, you know, they had to do things differently. They had to travel at night. You know, they had to know where they're going. They had to have a full tank of gas. They had to make sure that, you know, they had a sack lunch, you know, to, to, and, and to know where they're going. So there's no stops in between and to travel at, at night to uh, avoid or evade harassment, essentially. OK, but what happened during those trips? Right. What happened as they traveled from place to place? to, you know, play music. Well, they actually created music um, on the road. During those car rides at night, there were songs being written. And I'm gonna tell a little bit more about that here in a moment. But not only that, they created a sense of livelihood, right? And so, and, and I say that because, you know, although they weren't always paid, this, this, this ex these experiences, and I believe they were in their 20s in this photograph, um, these experiences really became a part of who they were, who they are, um, and really became their their life, whether they were actually paid. Sometimes they were compensated, but, you know, it really wasn't about the money. It was more or less an identity thing for them. Um, and then also created deeply meaningful experiences. And the way the reason we know that is because, you know, my grandpa, grandpa in this picture it is in his 20s, but now he's 91. And he can still recall these experiences and recall these moments of traveling with the Pilgrim Wonders as some of the greatest times of his life. And so we know that they're deeply personal. There were marriages, there were kids that, you know, happened out of this experience, out of the, these, these experiences <clears throat> and this specific time where they were, you know, a musical group. And then they also performed on the Chitlin circuit. This is this is a historical, uh, you know, uh, basically a historical nod at the Chitlin circuit, which is something that's been written about extensively, which is basically, again, during segregation, you know, blacks couldn't play or colored then couldn't play, you know, certain venues. And so they had a network of venues that they could play in the South. And the, 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 the Pilgrim Wonders also did that as well. So here we have, you know, in, you know, almost 100 years ago, about 80 years ago, we have, you know, musical creativity and music as a shared experience. This music thing is really meaningful for this, this, this group, for the Pilgrim Wonders. We also have music as experience created memories. Again, so these memories, these are things, stories that they can recall. And as they're describing it, it takes them right back to that very moment, to that very place. Um, lifelong friendships. Some of these guys have passed on. Um, actually, most of them have. But the you know the it is definitely true to say that those friendships last lasted a lifetime. Okay, feelings of joy. These are they often describe these these performances in this time period as one of the you know the the happiest times of their lives. Happiness and transformation. Transformation is also a spiritual nod because they were a gospel group. 
And so th there was a, a really deep connection to spirituality as they would sing about, you know, their love for their creator and, and people and share that experience and, and people would, you know, experience a transformation in their spirit and, and in their mood and, you know, in their, and in their way of being and how they showed up in their, in their stream of consciousness. So some of the psychological themes are creativity. Um, there's that connectedness through shared experience, a phenomenology, a, phenom a, a phenomenology of not just music, but a phenomenology of, you know, being a, a, a black man in the 1940s, you know, traveling in, throughout the, the South. So phenomenology is definitely really, really prevalent there. There is coping because, again, this, you know, music during this period for them, it really gave them a sense of being, you know, and affirmation through, you know, uh, the performances and feedback from audience, okay, and then identity as well. Right. So it brings me to this recording. This is uh, Smoothing Out the Rough Way by the Pilgrim Wonders, recorded in, I believe, yeah, Davenport, Iowa. Now, there is a good story about this record, which is why I included this image in the presentation. So this album, the, the Smoothing Out the Rough Way, actually there's a story behind it. So the Pilgrim Wonders were traveling at night and the conditions were bad. There is even another story of the windshield wiper breaking and the, the Pilgrim Wonders tying my grandpa on one end and another guy on the other end, tying a rope around the and just pulling them so that the, the, the windshield wipers would, you know, could be kind of a manual, manual thing. But the smoothing out the rough way came about um, as they were driving. Right. And so. The road was bad. It was bumpy. And my, my grandpa gets to singing. He just starts singing, you know, and on cue, the Pilgrim Wonders would just fall in line, right? And, you know, background harmony, like, it's like on cue, right? Just like the movies. So he would sing that, you know, uh, like I'm working on the road, working on the road, and Lord, I'm smoothing, smoothing out the rough way, right? Smoothing out the rough way, all right? So that song became a song out of that experience. And it was it was sang all over the South. So the Pilgrim Wonders sang that song all over. And the other part of this story is that it, that song, that very song was later made famous by a, a famous group. And the Pilgrim Wonders who originally wrote it actually never received credit because, you know, they didn't really know about copyright and things like that back in those days. But it was basically one of those songs that became popular and, you know, you know, and credit didn't ever really go to the, the Pilgrim Wonders for that. But it, it, it really it, that's really about the, the musical create the organic musical creativity that, you know, sparks so much. OK, now this brings me to the next image you see, which is my dad at age seven. That is Jeff Mim Sr. And he was actually uh, inspired by the Pilgrim Wonders quite a bit. I'm going to read a little bit uh, um, about that here in a second. Um, I had to. So, again, this is deeply personal for me. My father is is no longer with us. Right. So he passed away about five years ago. And it's so funny because a couple of years before he passed away, I was able to interview him for a class project. And I think this interview was like about purpose or, you know, identity, how do you know, um, you know, about purpose, really? And okay, and I'm just going to read through this. So I asked my dad, when did you first realize your purpose in life? And his response was the first time I heard live music, I had to be about six or seven years old. I remember the Pilgrim Wonders were practicing at our house, and the guitar player was playing a cherry red Gibson SG. Man, it blew me away. I knew then this is what I'm going to do. My dad bought me a guitar and I've been playing ever since. So this was, you know, this is really a jewel, you know, for me and for our family's history, just to have this, because, you know, one of the things that like really sticks out about this to me is, you know, here you go, you have this kid. So many of us are on this journey to find what it is that we're connected to, right? We're on this journey to seek out the meanings and our purpose in our life so that way we can continue and be our, you know, become our highest um, self, be the best versions of ourselves. 
Well, what really stood out to this was his affirmation, how a seven-year-old can know in a moment, you know, understand that, you know, hey, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. So that clarity, that moment of affirmation for a seven-year-old, seven-year-old was just really profound. I, I find that to be really profound. And the reason I could say that is because I know what became of my dad's life. This, the, the, the kid that you see in the picture became a man who produced inspired um, and taught a lot of people how to play music. Um, you know, he was always looking for his very next time to perform. So always looking forward to that. And then, you know, this, this, this image, this, this picture is really a moment where we can say his musical journey begins. And so then another thing that comes up is the continued legacy, you know, him inheriting the legacy of using music and all of its, um, you know, benefits and all of its, you know, intricacies, really, um, using music and continuing on down that path, making that a really um, huge part of his own journey as well. All right, so this brings me to the next image where uh, talking about life in Oklahoma City. So this is the Mims family band. That's my dad, Jeff Mims Sr., um, a grown up man now uh, in the picture. Um, to the far left, my sister Shannon, who plays the trumpet and sings. And then my mom, who is a classically trained pianist uh, since age eight. And then that's me with my arms folded, uh, the lead singer at age five years old. Um, and so the Mims family recorded their first album, Christian Home, on the family-owned record label, Siobhan Records and Management. So there's actually a story behind this. And so, you know, as you can imagine, my dad was really, you know, a music first type of you know, guy, he really loved this. Remember, this is the guy who was, you know, when his wife was pregnant, he's jamming and, and didn't really want to let go of that moment. Um, so I was offered uh, my first major record um, recording contract at age five. And my dad turned it down for a number of reasons. You know, we're a family band. We're going to stick together. We're not going to allow, you know, um, you know, Junior to go and, you know, and be away from his, you know, from, be away from us, be away from the family. And so in response, in response to that, he created his own, uh, you know, independent record label and, and management company where he produced albums, uh, original music for us and for also other artists. Um, at one time, you guys may remember the group Colored Me Bad. My dad produced and, and, and played guitar uh, for them, um, you know, back in back in the day. Um, so also there is original music, there's creative expressions of joy, faith, gratitude, and life experiences. There's one song that sticks out uh, to, that that sticks out to me that my mom and dad wrote actually together. It's called Flowers, and it's it's about giving someone their flowers while you can smell them, while they can still smell them. And the lyrics go something like, um, you know, I remember so many times I picked up the phone, got you on the line. It didn't matter, you know, whether it was night or day, you always had the right words to say. Okay. And, you know, so, so there was always this, you know, um, in real time, um, acknowledging the things that were happening, happening around us, you know, through life and then putting them also putting those things within the music. Some more themes that come up are the entrepreneurial creativity you know, in response to not wanting to be a part of the mainstream record label, because again, with that is some loss of control, you know, some creative control, if you will. And so my dad believed that that was an important part of, you know, of, of our journey as a family and, um, you know, and for, for, the, for the group. And then again, there is the shared and connected experience. So music is not, you know, being a musical family um, and I say that for a number of reasons, like we, everybody plays individually, but we also play music and share music, you know, together. So being a musical family, this, this music is something that, you know, is just really always, always there. It's always with us and at the dinner table or, you know, you know, whether it's a family get together or, you know, or actually getting ready, getting the family together, getting the family together before a performance, you know, and rehearsals and things like that. So this is something that is also being passed on. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about a little bit about the return. 
for the return again, we're talking about music and meaning. So you, you're you're already starting to see a trend of you know one generation you know really creating music, creating creating ways to use music you know as a for a number of reasons to cope with the, the environment, the conditions of racial segregation, and and just to push forward and create a livelihood and foster relationships and build a sense of you know community and things like that, and then to pass that on to um, my dad, who again, in that the picture before that was passing that on to his kids and his wife. And, and, and so, and so now where it really comes, the return really focuses on me. This is the part in, in my journey where things start to, you know, really um, emerge to the surface, if you will. And so this is the final stage of the hero's journey by Joseph Campbell, in which he returns, we're talking about the hero, returns home to his ordinary world, a changed man. He will have grown as a person, learned many things, faced many terrible dangers and even death, but now looks forward to the start of a new life. His return may bring fresh hope to those he left behind, a direct solution to their problems, or perhaps a new perspective for everyone to consider. And so this really makes me think about, you know, again, my journey, you know, the, the adversities and things that I face, the things that I've learned and why, you know, what are really the deeper meanings behind my personal connection to music, to my music? What, what is my story regarding this musical experience? And so, uh, and so here we go. We're gonna talk about a little bit about, you know, this part for me and my musical journey. So now we are uh, talking about, you know, okay, so here we go. So we got me, a lifelong musician and a descendant of musicians, musical creators. So by 2009, I recorded with various artists and genres of gospel, jazz, reggae, rock, and hip hop. My first solo album was the journal entry, 2009. And again, just like my father, self-produced, self-wrote, um, you know, and published, um, you know, my own, my own, my first, my first independent journal entry album, which was actually 2009. This album is reflective of things that, that I was experiencing, you know, during that time period. So in real time, it is, you know, kind of cliche to its name. It is my journal entry. It's, it's my disclosure of, you know, my self-expression really of where I am in that moment. And then also to the album below that is also, uh, Jeff Mims, Just One Way, that is another album or single that was produced by me um, in 2013. Um, again, just another, you know, song that I couldn't escape and really needed to, you know, really needed to create. And so I try to, I try to keep myself honest as much as possible um, because of the, the way that it makes me feel when I'm able to create and get that information, get that, that musical creativity that's going on within me um, out and able to express it in a way that really feels comfortable and really feels natural, to be honest. And then we've got, uh, so we've got three pictures happening, right? We've got the top picture where you can see me, I've got my arms around to the, to, to on the right side of me in the picture, that's my dad. So uh, that's my dad directly below, that's my, in the bottom corner, you can see me holding my arms around my son, who is two. Um, and in the next picture, that's him again at age five. So there's another story behind the picture um, at the top. So I, I, as I mentioned, my dad has passed on. He passed away, unfortunately. But this picture in the top, that was the last performance that I ever played with him. Um, that's the last time we ever shared the stage. And that was in April of 2016 um, at the Oklahoma uh, City Arts Festival. OK, and then if you look down to the corner, we've got the picture of me holding, you know, my son. He's two in that picture. Uh, that was his first performance and it's on the same stage. So that was the last performance with my dad, the first performance with my son. And so this is a moment that really sticks out to me. Right. This is something that I'll always remember, uh, you know, sharing three generations of, you know, our bloodline, you know, sharing music, doing what we love, doing what's within us, uh, you know, and doing that before an audience. 
And then directly below that, we have uh, my, the, his name is Ahadu. Um, he's age five in that picture, and that's his first piano recital. So, Okay, so yeah, so I'll, go, I'll just go ahead and read. I just kind of surmise it, but I'll go ahead and read it. Um, in April 2016, my, my two-year-old son performed live, and it was the last time I would perform and share the stage with my dad. Three generations of musical creators bonded by not only blood, uh, but by music. Sharing this experience on stage was one I'll never forget. Okay, so so here here we go. Here this is where it kind of you know comes full circle, or things really start to click and really make sense of you know where I am now as a you know as a aspiring psychologist and a, as a researcher. I'm now learning more about my life's purpose using music to help people heal. Um, the return home to a place of a newfound awareness continues to nourish me creatively. So understanding that you know one. The night that I was born was, you know, was really a concert, literally, uh, is really, is really, you know, it heightens my awareness and my sensitivity to really helps me understand or play with this idea of purpose, right? It, you know, it, you mean having this really subjective uh, inner feeling and inclination to just want to play music and to really just feel alive and so many embodied experience with music. This really helps me. This this autoethnography has brought me to a newfound awareness, definitely. Um, beginning with my grandfather's inspiration and love for music, a deeply rooted connection was inherited, cherished, and then handed down to my father. This was evidence in the intimate moments we shared when my dad would play guitar as my grandfather sang. As we made music together, emotions ran high and tears would flow down their faces as everything wrong somehow in this moment was made right and that's very true i can i'm i'm thinking about a specific experience during a thanksgiving one year where you know we were just sitting around uh playing music and grandpa got to sing in my dad is playing and i'm playing guitar and it was just it was just a real moment a deep moment for us of of bonding you know and, you know, emotions ran high and, you know, tears, you know, they expressed themselves with, with crying and, you know, have tears of joy, you know what I mean? And, uh, and so these are moments, and this is not the only moment, but, you know, understanding now, you know, how even with my own children, watching them have their own personal uh, experiences with music, um, it really, it really gives me a newfound awareness, you know, and, and is meaningful in ways that are beyond, you know, what I'm able to actually even describe, honestly. Um, and so some of the dialogue that, you know, or even further research that comes out of this whole music meaning and the return is, how can we continue to explore the deeper meanings of our individual life journey? I remember when I first did this autoethnography, um, everyone that I encountered, I would ask them, you know, hey, man, you know, have you ever done, by chance, have you ever done an autoethnography on your family's history, you know, to just to see what you find? Uh, because I really feel like um, there are so many meanings wrapped up that we haven't even fully explored, right? And so, you know, as we're looking at our life, life journey, uh, there, there are just, you know, questions that essentially haven't been asked yet. And so this is room for Further dialogue, more uh, research, continued studies. Uh, I remember uh, doing a poll, and the poll was something to the extent of my life without music would be incomplete, just fine, or not really sure. And about 80 to 85 to 90 percent of the people said incomplete. And so we understand that music has this, you know, way of really being a part of people's lived experiences, a part of their lives. And, you know, if people were to look back at their lives, there are moments that stick out. A lot of times music has been a part of that. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, there are more studies coming out regarding uh, music. There are a lot of contemporary studies happening with music, phenomenology of music, music in the brain. There, there are neurological studies being done on music. 
health benefits of music, music during uh, performance, during exercise. Um, and so, yeah, there, there's tons of stuff coming out. Um, and I'm actually also uh, in this doctoral dissertation doing uh, my dissertation on a specific, a specific experience that happens um, during the musical perform performance. All right. And so I just wanted to, to summarize and, and, and summarize this whole presentation basically with a few key themes that 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 really stand out as we're looking at, you know, this whole music meaning and the return. So the desire to feel connected uh, there, even for the Pilgrim Wonders, there was this this need to feel connected to other um you know, human beings essentially through performance. Uh, this was the reason they would travel. It was important enough from the, from, for them to travel from one place to the next because that connection was needed, not only needed for, for the, the Pilgrim Wonders who were the, the singers, but also needed for the, that connection was needed for the audience, needed for the community, right? And so the need to be seen, heard and felt that was also important, again, because we're talking about, you know, racial segregation, discrimination, things like that, where, you know, uh, being a man even uh, didn't always, you know, was, was, was sometimes questioned. You know, your own being a human being was questioned. And so the, the need to be seen and, and heard and felt music allowed that, allowed that. Um, organic responses to the environment. With the back to the story of the smooth and out the rough way as they're driving along a bumpy road. Um, this was an, an organic response to the things that were happening, that, that actual drive, um, you know, on the road. It became a song and that song became a popular song. And so, you know, and people felt connected to that song as they felt God would smooth out the, the rough ways of, of their life. And so, they're also deeply spiritual meanings, right? Uh, the, the love for God, you know, as we play and sing and, and cry, these are deeply spiritual uh, connections and feelings that we have as we, we share that. Cultural tradition and inheritance. This is definitely a part of, of, of my family's cultural tradition. This is something that we always do when we get together even now. Our kids are starting to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's fun. We laugh, we joke, uh, we have a good time. It's just, it, it really is a part of, uh, you know, a, a tradition that I hope that we can continue. Um, that legacy, the legacy of creativity, the legacy of entrepreneurship, the legacy of creating music, sharing music, writing music, producing music. Uh, and then that shared wisdom from my dad and the shared wisdom from my, my grandpa. Uh, those are really key things. That knowledge is really sacred, you know, as I think about how many times my dad would, you know, take his knowledge of musical experience and really want to share it with other people through inspiration. And maybe it's teaching someone how to play guitar, giving them a lesson, forming a band and, you know, getting them a few shows, things like that. Like um, it, it really is sharing that wisdom, that 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 wisdom of the lived experience and, and what it feels, those meanings I really think is cool. Also returning with a boon. So this is an autoethnography for my life's journey, my story with music and how it's inspired um, me and, and how I've util utilized my gifts. And, and so now being a doctoral candidate, uh, this is me returning with my boon, with my and sharing my gift um, um, and the calling, answering the calling and then arriving or, or showing up with a newfound perspective or a newfound way of being. Um, my grandfather certainly had his journey, right? He had his own individual heroic musical journey and his autoethnography would look, you know, quite different from mine. Uh, and this, the same can be said about my dad, you know, having his life journey and really living, uh, you know, really living honestly in his calling just for, for everyone that, that knew him. They, they knew, you know, knew him as a musician, as being a part of, you know, who he is and as, an, as his identity. Um, and so, yeah, his his journey and his return with the boon was was really different, you know, um, and, you know, and, and special. So that really concludes uh, this presentation. Again, this was the, the basis for this presentation was um, my autoethnography that was done on my family's history with music. And the goal was to 
really explore that and see if there would be something worth sharing to bring with the, to bring to the community and share these gifts and share these information. And I hope that this will inspire you and encourage you to help nourish and, and explore the different things that are meaningful um, within your life and uh, along your life journey. My name is Jeff Mims. You can, for more information, more studies on, um, you know, music or music phenomenology or just different social science, research studies, psychology studies on music. I'm constantly posting this, uh, um, you know, really, really uh, groundbreaking research. I'm constantly uh, posting that and you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, this information is all available through there. You can contact me through there if you have questions or need more sources or would like for me to explain any more. Or if we can continue this dialogue, definitely reach out. All right. Thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed. Bye-bye.